Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Cantor Stephen Lee. I'm the Cantor of the Central Synagogue. We welcome you uh, here tonight. It's uh, sort of happy and sad. It's happy to see so many people in our synagogue. It's also very sad that 70, 75 years after the Second World War and the Holocaust that we have, we have to come together to discuss anti-Semitism. It really is a shame, a shame on all of us. Um, I would just like to mention very briefly before we start and before I introduce you to uh, Rabbi Barry Marcus, the rabbi of the uh, Central Synagogue, I would just like um, to point out on your, on your seats there was a, uh, a brochure, Grand Central brochure. We started a whole new program at Central Synagogue. We've rebranded, we've called ourselves Grand Central and yeah, <laughs> train station, you get it. And um, we have so many different events happening. For, for, for whatever you want, whether it be films, talks, and everything is really high quality. So uh, have a look at that in your spare time. We do hope to see you at all these future events. I would now like to um, invite uh, Rabbi Barry Marcus to uh, welcome you all. Thank you. Thank you. Stephen, thank you for um, all your hard work in organizing this and the other events. It's the second event that we've actually had in the synagogue today. A little earlier we had 200 imams, clerics, and various faith leaders who marched from Regent's Park and then stopped at our synagogue and went on to Westminster. So it's been quite an eventful day for us um, at Central Synagogue. I'd just like to echo what... Uh, Stephen said a few moments ago, it's wonderful to see uh, the hall full. It is, of course, sad that it's a subject that draws us here. If we had some little cooking class this evening advertised, I wonder how many people would bother to come. But then on the other hand, it's the first time in 20 years that we've actually had to turn people away from shul, from synagogue. I may have to see a psychoanalyst after this evening, after that. Um, I want to welcome our very distinguished panel here this evening. Douglas Murray. <laughs> Majid Nawaz. Brendan O'Neill. And Simon Rodan. <laughs> Last but not least, I'd also like to uh, welcome our moderator, Dr. Alan Mendoza. <laughs> he's under severe pressure this evening because his claim to fame is He's Raquel's brother, so he's under scrutiny this evening. But seriously, though, we thank you all for your time, and we look forward for uh, an illuminating evening. Can I just ask those who may have mobile phones or any other media technology, uh, please switch them off now. Thank you. And now we hand over to Dr. Alan Mendoza. Thank you. Does this work? Yeah. Okay, thank you, Rabbi Marcus, thank you, Stephen, um, and thank you all for coming tonight. Um, as has already been said, it's a, a sad topic that we're obviously discussing. Um, I don't think any of us would have thought we'd have needed to discuss this topic five or ten years ago here in Britain. I think it's a sad testimony that we are indeed doing so. And I think you'll agree the panel we have is t as testimony to why so many of you are here tonight to hear from um, the distinguished panellists on the subject we're going to speak about here. Now, let me explain what's going to happen. We are going to start with um, short five-minute uh, sort of opening statements from each of the panellists. Uh, Brendan O'Neill, who, as you know, is uh, the editor of uh, Spiked Online, will kick off. Then Simone Rodin, who joins us from uh, the American Jewish Committee in Paris, will uh, probably t tell us a bit more about what's happening on the continent in this way. And I think we do want to explore the European dimension of what is happening, and maybe even the global dimension of what's happening tonight. Um, then Majid Nawaz, who of course founded the 
um, counter-extremism think tank Quilliam Foundation, and still there today, and is, of course, also the um, uh, parliamentary candidate for the Liberal Democrats in Hampstead and Kilburn, will uh, then speak. And finally, Douglas Murray, who's my Henry Jackson Society colleague and also the contributing editor at The Spectator, will um, give his thoughts. We will then move into a slight moderated discussion between us where we will uh, speak for a few minutes about some of the issues raised before we go to questions. And the questions will work like this. There are two, I think, microphones, yes, two on each side there. We will take questions from people who queue up at question time. So you'll have to queue there um, to be called. Um, and what we will do is probably take three, maybe four, depending on um, demand questions at a time. The panelists will then give their thoughts on that, on the ones that they feel are relevant, and will then uh, turn it back to you for more questions. Um, so that's the format. Do hope you'll enjoy it. And with that, I'm going to ask Brendan O'Neill to kick off for us. Thank you. Thank you. you. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, one thing has become really clear over the past six weeks, I think, which is that lots of influential people don't think anti-Semitism is a particularly bad thing. Certainly, they see anti-Semitism as being less bad than Islamophobia. Uh, you know, attacks on Muslims make the opinion-forming set really angry in a way that attacks on Jews just do not. Amongst the uh, cultural left and much of the respectable media in Europe... Violent or racist assaults on Jews are seen as less important, less bad than violent or racist assaults on people of the Islamic faith. And you could really see this, I think, around the terrible Chapel Hill shootings in America, where three Muslims were killed by some crazy Richard Dawkins fan, allegedly. And very quickly, the liberal Twitter sphere and the commentariat went into overdrive, and they were demanding to know where were all the articles condemning these killings and highlighting the vulnerability of Muslims in the West. Before long, there were so many articles about the lack of articles that there were no space left for the articles about what actually happened there. And um, I think... Obviously, that killing switched on people's sympathy, lots of people's sympathy, not just the liberal elites, of course. But after the synagogue shooting in Copenhagen and after the kosher Delhi massacre in Paris, it was a bit different. There was a kind of palpable uncertainty. What should we say? How angry should we get? There was a kind of, there was more awkwardness than anger. Or, or, you know, consider the desecration of 250 Jewish graves in France a few days ago. You know, they were daubed with Nazi symbols, really wrecked by these anti-Semites. Where was the anger? Where were the articles about the lack of articles? Where were the hashtags? It was not evident that people were made angry by that event. And again and again, I think influential people fail to condemn and confront anti-Semitism. For some reason, confronting anti-Semitism head-on makes them feel uncomfortable. But I think it's even worse than that, because some people who really should know better actually lend legitimacy to anti-Semitic violence. You know, after the Chapel Hill shootings, the cry went up that this must be recognised as a hate crime. But when Jews in Europe are attacked, often the opposite happens. People say maybe it wasn't a hate crime. Maybe it was just misfired political anger. Maybe it was justifiable. Uh, you know, so the respected religious commentator, Karen Armstrong, said about the kosher supermarket massacre, it was about Palestine. It had nothing to do with anti-Semitism. She was only echoing the BBC's Tim Wilcox, who said maybe the Jews of France brought the Paris massacre on themselves by treating Palestinians so badly, because, of course, all Jews must bear collective guilt for that. There was uh, the recent court case in Germany in which a judge described the firebombing of a synagogue as a political act. Anger with Israel, anger with the Gaza conflict. It was political, he said, not anti-Semitic. And this week we hear that officials in Preston uh, blamed anti-Semitism on Israel. So anti-Semitism is seen by a lot of influential people as political it has a strain of justice to it. It can be a radical act. Why is there this, this kind of sympathy for Muslims and this discomfort uh, when Jews are attacked? I think the reason the liberal elite is so obsessed with Islamophobia is because they've turned Muslims into their kind of pet victims. They actively trawl for evidence of Islamophobia 
because uh, they can use it to fortify their own prejudices. They can use it to fortify their view of ordinary white working class people as racist, as Islamophobic, as stupid. And they can use it to fortify multiculturalism. They can also use evidence of Islamophobia to silence dissent. Any criticism of Islam is now seen as phobic, hateful, racist. You must shut up. You can't say this. You can't say that. So these people have a vested interest in maintaining the myth of Islamophobia, and they go trawling for examples of it. And often it's the flip reversal situation with anti-Semitism. You, the individual, has to go trawling for information about anti-Semitism because they, the media, often ignore it. So what is the impact of these, this shocking double standard in relation to different forms of prejudice? I think it has a devastating impact. I think the inability of the liberal elite to confront anti-Semitism creates the space for more anti-Semitism. Because when the, the media and the, and the cultural elites fail to confront anti-Semitism and actually even apologize for it, they give the green light to anti-Semites. I think it's, it's really European society's acquiescence to anti-Semitism that is the key problem that we face because they send the message that actually it's not that bad to attack Jews. It's kind of understandable. It's related to Israel and blah, blah, blah. What can we do about this? Just finally, I want to throw out a few ideas. I don't want to tell Jewish people how to conduct their affairs, but I do want to suggest, uh, I want to posit that the current victim narrative being promoted by some campaign groups, the idea that all of Europe is unsafe for Jews is not very helpful. I also think Netanyahu's interventions have been very unhelpful. His appeal to Jews in scary Europe to come to Israel actually contributes to the climate of fear. And this actually can also be a boon to the anti-Semites because it gives them the impression that the Jews are on the defensive. They are weak. The anti-Semites are winning. But the fact is, Europe remains largely safe for Jews. The anti-Semites haven't won but Netanyahu and others risk giving them the idea that they have through depicting Jews as fragile and in need of rescue. I was really disturbed to read that Dan Uzan, the 37-year-old Jewish guard who was killed outside the Copenhagen uh, synagogue, had been asking for younger people to take over his role in the months before he was killed. And that's a really pressing question, I think. Where are the younger Jews? Where are the younger activists. I think that is what we need today. Young Jews to train up, work out, be visible, fight back alongside other communities that are willing to offer them solidarity. We need Jewish muscle to show that the anti-Semites aren't winning and that Jews actually have a long and fruitful future in Europe. Thank you, Brendan. Simon. Hello. Um, thank you very much for having me. Um, I originally wanted to, to, to say something else, but I was very inspired by your speech. Um, the situation in France is probably the most serious um, for Jews um, in Europe. Um, to some extent, what we saw over the past couple of months um, was not at all a surprise for the Jewish community. We knew very well that at some point or the other we would be facing um, the, an attack like this. We didn't know when, we didn't know against whom, we didn't know where, but it, we knew it would happen. We also know today that we'll, it will happen again, that it's just the beginning of something and it's certainly not the end. Um, we need to look back um, to the situation over the past 15 years. You said earlier on that here in the UK you couldn't have imagined to speak about anti-Semitism five years ago. In France the situation is very, very different. We have seen a, a, an increase of anti -Semitism anti-Semitism really over the past 15 years. Um, when you look back to the years of 1998 or 1997, for example, we used to have about 85, 86 anti-Semitic acts a year. You go to the year, the year of 2000, you suddenly jump up to 400 acts. And basically, ever since the year of 2000, we have not managed to go below that number. 
This year, we had 840 anti-Semitic acts becoming more and more violent. It has been an increase of 91% um, over the, over the, for, from, from the pre previous year, but there has been an increase of 124% of violent anti-Semitic acts, meaning these are not just insults. Uh, people get beaten up, uh, people get uh, seriously injured, and people get even killed. Um, as you probably know, four people have been killed um, last month in the attack in, uh, in the kosher supermarket, but when you look back to the previous years, in 2012, we had the attack against a Jewish school, where Jewish school children and, and a teacher have been killed. Uh, you also can go back to the year of 2006, when a Jewish boy by the name of Ilan Halimi was abducted, tortured, and ultimately killed. So, the, the, really, the situation has gone from bad to worse. That means that um, basically we have let um, the situation gone from bad to worse. Um, for a very long time, for the first few years, um, the government at the time, the Jospin government was, was the socialist government. Whenever Jewish community leaders would go to see them, they would say, well, it's not really anti-Semitism. It's just criminality. It's just hooliganism. It's nothing in particular to do with the, with the Jewish community. So we wasted a lot of time. The situation has now become so serious that um, uh, th that now we can't turn away um, anymore. Um, or, or only six months ago, um, the government would say, "Well, it's inter these are not anti-Semitic acts; it's intercommunal tension." Now we can't say this anymore. The government is starting to speak out. Political leaders are starting to speak out. And we are very clearly starting to understand that the problem of anti-Semitism is not just an issue of the Jewish community. It's a problem for our entire democracy. When you have someone like the prime minister say that um, uh, when Jews leave France, um, that means France is, France is, is dying. Um, it, it's something that he has repeatedly been saying. Um, we are starting to understand that this is a major problem for the entire society. Um, and to be very honest, I think it's, um, it's, it's a message that should be sent out to the rest of the world. It should, should be sent out to democracies all over the world, that if a democracy cannot protect its minority anymore, what does it mean for any democracy? What does it mean for the UK? What does it mean for the United States? What does it mean to the any, any democracy in the world? Um, so the government now in France is, is, is acknowledging it. I think it's a very important, th for, very important thing to do. Uh, but we also need to acknowledge where it comes from. And I think this is another part that has been very, very difficult. Um, Anti-Semitism from the extreme right is easy. We had uh, a desecration of cemeteries 20 years ago in France, um, in Carpentras. Uh, we had one million people in the streets. Anti-Semitism coming from another minority that itself is subject to racism, Islamophobia, is more difficult, in particular for the left. And I think this is also something you have drawn on. Um, and I think we need to be saying this very, very clearly. Because the reality is, if we don't speak out very, very clearly, if we don't name the problem, we can't solve it. Um, so um, I will stop there, because I know we only have five minutes. Um, but I think that is one of the major, major issues that we need to say, and what we need to say, is that we need to be able to name the problem. Thank you, Simon. Uh, both of you have given plenty to come back to in a few minutes. But uh, next, on to Majid. Thank you, Alan. I'm going to ask everybody to indulge me for a second. I want to play you something. But before I do, I want to issue with a warning that it's going to be uh, distressing for some of you. Talk about activity of those people. There will be always, yes, it is freedom of speech, but. And the turning point is but. Why do we still say, but, when we... I do apologize if that distressed anyone in the room. That is the audio from the Copenhagen shooting. And the shooter chose chillingly the moment 
to let loose a volley of shots just as the speaker was making the point that when people pretend to defend freedom of speech, they caveat it with the word but. And he decided to choose that moment to let off the shots. He then went, as we all know, to a synagogue and killed some innocent Jewish people. Before that, it was in France at the kosher shop. And before that, it was in Belgium at the museum. And I really want to, first of all, congratulate all of you for being here today, because that was a cafe. This is a synagogue. They had security outside the cafe. They had, in fact, they had close protection for the cartoonist. And yet, despite that, this incident occurred. And so it could just as easily occur in London. It could occur here at this very synagogue. And the sheer fact that all of you are here this evening is a testament to your own bravery, to your own courage, to your own determination, to say, to refuse to cower in the face of this terrorism and to say, by voting with your actions and your feet, never again. Because something we learnt after the rise of Nazism in Germany was of the, the danger of the banality of evil. What we learnt is that if we allow ourselves to sleepwalk into an atmosphere in which people feel uncomfortable to speak their minds, in which people are slowly taken out, group by group, one by one, and this sort of obfuscation that we just heard is used. Instead of calling a spade a spade, people say, it's, it's not anti-Semitism, it's community tension. It's not about freedom of speech, but if we allow ourselves to sweep, sleepwalk into that climate without standing firm and strong and drawing a line as we are doing here this evening, drawing a line in the sand and refusing to be coward, then before we know it, it will be too late. Because the question that we were uh, uh, here to address this evening is, are we, have we reached crisis point? Well, I'll ask you to answer that question based upon the recording that you've just heard. If in Europe today, people are speaking in synagogues or in cafes or in libraries, and they're talking about freedom of speech as the subject or about anti-Semitism as the subject for discussion that evening, and they feel scared to even enter the hall because they're worried that somebody's going to attack them merely for speaking, then I'd argue that that is a level of crisis point because the very foundation of democracy is, it rests upon a few points. One of them is the right to express yourself because without the right to express yourself, you cannot campaign for the political party you represent, you cannot go and vote for the one for the party of your choice. You cannot hold the, those uh, uh, in authority above us to account for their mistakes. All of that rests upon freedom of speech. And then secondly, to protect the minorities. Because as we've just heard, we must judge the worth, the merit of any society by how much it protects those who are the most vulnerable within it. My own journey to some of you may know I spent 13 years on the leadership of an Islamist organization. And my own journey to that organization began because of my own teenage black and white interpretation of the, Jesnia, uh, of, the, of the genocide in Bosnia against Muslims and of the domestic racism I faced at home in Essex where I was born and raised. We were chased down the streets. This is a year before the murder of Stephen Lawrence. And we were chased through the streets by a neo-Nazi paramilitary organization known as Combat 18. Some of you may have heard of them. Uh, they, were, uh, uh, they were chasing us with uh, screwdrivers and with knives and with hammers. But there was one man who I refer to in my, uh, in my book who I've never met since. And it's important to tell this story because it's why I'm here tonight. And it's in honor of that one man. I don't know how he's doing today. I don't know where he is. But I hope he's doing well. And I, I, I tried for the life of me to remember his name when I was writing my memoirs. And something in my head told me his name was Matt. So I decided to call him Matt. And I, I apologize to this man if that wasn't his name. But I found myself on one occasion surrounded by a bunch of neo-Nazi thugs. Uh, and they had hammers and they had screwdrivers and they were about to uh, literally beat me to death. I was 15 years old. And this man came running from across the street. I'd never met him before. 
And uh, he was larger than me. And he stopped them all. And he said, what are you doing? This, this is a, he's a child. He's a, he's a kid. Why are, you, why are you attacking him like this? And they turned to Matt and they said, you must be a Paki lover. And then what they did is they proceeded to stab and beat Matt all over his body and force me to watch. And that man saved my life that night. And it's the reason I'm here today. Because what helped me leave my own anger and hatred behind was of, because of the actions of people like that. So when we hear the audio that we've just heard at the beginning of what I've just played, what I'd urge everyone to remember is that we have to draw a line in the sand. The solution isn't to leave Europe. Europe is your home. You belong here as much as everybody else, and if anyone on this panel has anything to do with it, we will continue to say never again. We will continue to speak out in your defense, even if it means at risk, because we know the consequences of what happens if we allow that line in the sand to shift and move to a point where it's unrecognizable. And I will end by saying that, of course, we have to acknowledge where the threat is coming from. President Obama gave a speech yesterday, and I fear, I fear that he is succumbing, and we all succumb, to what I've been calling of late the Voldemort effect. If anyone's read Harry Potter, you know what I'm talking about. Where he who must not be named, we're so scared of naming the threat that it increases the hysteria. We're dealing proportionately, proportionately, not only by the assessment of our security services, but also by all the statistics that look into this and by the monitoring services, anti-Semitic attacks are proportionately far, far, far higher. It's not even one level higher, three times the level of attacks against Muslims. You know, they are far higher. And proportionately, the risk to the safety in our societies, we have to be frank and candid about this. They come from the threat of jihadist attacks. They do not come from, proportionately, from far-right neo-Nazi extremists wanting to blow up synagogues and what have you. That is a challenge, it is a threat, but I'm talking about proportionately where the focus of the main problem is coming from. So when President Obama gave this speech, he said, you know, we will not allow these people to, to claim they are religious leaders, they have nothing to do with Islam. No, they are not Islam, the Islam, of course they're not, nor am I, nor is anyone really, because Islam is what Muslims make it. But they have something to do with Islam. They have something to do with it. If you're gonna argue with one of them, and I do all the time, um, you're not discussing Mein Kampf. You're discussing Islamic texts. They have something to do with Islam and the danger of not naming it, what I call the Islamist ideology. And just to bet one sentence, what is Islamism? Islam is a religion. Islamism is the desire to impose any version of that religion over society. It's the politicization of my own religion. What is jihadism? The use of force to spread Islamism. The danger of not naming this ideology is twofold. Firstly, within the Muslim context, those liberal Muslims, reforming Muslims, gay Muslims, feminist Muslims, uh, dissenting voices, minority sects, the Ismailis, the, the Shia, the, the, all these different minorities within the minority of the Muslim community are in, immediately betrayed. How are they betrayed? Because you deprive them of the lexicon, the language to employ against those who are attempting to silence their progressive efforts within their own communities by not naming the ideology. You surrender the debate to the extremists and, 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 and actually what happens as a result is, uh, is, is they hijack the debate, they monopolize the discourse, and communities divided even further apart, rather than bringing people together, even though the intention of the President Obama was to, to try and bring people together. The second danger is in the non-Muslim context. What happens if you don't name the Islamist ideology and distinguish it from Islam? President Obama in his speech said, there's an ideology we must challenge, and he didn't name it. So, think about it. You're sending out the message to the vast majority of, Amer of Americans there's an ideology you must challenge, but then you don't tell them what's it called. What are they gonna assume? The average American's gonna think, yeah, I've got to challenge an ideology, it's called Islam. You're only going to increase anti-Muslim hatred, like he who must not be named, you'll increase the hysteria, the Voldemort effect I call it, by not naming the ideology because the average guy out there will then assume the president is talking about the religion itself. 
But if you distinguish Islamist extremism and say, look, Islam's a religion. We're not going to tell you what good and bad Islam is. We're not going to define that for you. What we can say is you mustn't try and impose that on anyone else. If you do, that's called Islamism, the ideology. And that's what we have a problem with. Unless you make that distinction and isolate the people that you're challenging, the average non-Muslim out there in the world who doesn't know that will think, yes, we've got a challenge. The religion, all Muslims are bad. Let's drive them out of Europe. So actually, it doesn't do us any favors not to name this ideology. And with that, I'll end because I have someone far better than me who's waiting to speak. And finally, thank you, Majid. Douglas Murray, finally. Well, thank you very much, Alan. Thank you, uh, Majid, and everyone else. Um, well, l let me try to get down to some brass tacks, as it were, on this. Um, there's a lot to say. You've, you've heard uh, some very important points already. I'm not going to reiterate them. It's also, I think, not worth my while saying, um, you know, what the Muslim communities in the UK, for instance, should do. I think Majid is probably the only Muslim here, and he certainly doesn't need to be told what the problem is. <laughs> Um, I don't need to say what the wider problems are in the rest of the country among Christians and other non-Jews in Britain. Uh, I think that would be a waste of, of your time and my time. Uh, but I will talk, uh, presumptuously perhaps, but make a few observations about what Jews in the UK and I would argue in Europe um, need to be thinking about. And I will try to also say what you should do at this juncture. because. Um, actually, last summer, uh, Majid and I were both speaking at a, a rally in, um, in London, um, opposition to anti-Semitism outside the Royal Courts of Justice. I was very struck by the, um, a lot of things about that event and the organizing that went into it, uh, very admirable as the organizers were. Uh, one was that one of the rabbis who spoke uh, in her um, remarks, which were laudable and uh, much to be agreed with, uh, sort of sum, tried to summon up the spirit of Cable Street, and, and it didn't really work, and there was something tonally wrong and all sorts of other things, as she said, they shall not pass, and so on. And afterwards, I sort of realized what it was. I said to her, that, you know, the problem is it's no good saying they shall not pass. Who? Who? You know, if we see people in jack boots goose stepping down the streets of East London, yes, they shall not pass. We'll all be there, Jews, non Jews, Muslims, and so on. Yet we'll be there. But if you're not even willing to say who shall not pass, you're sure as hell not going to be able to stop them passing. And that's just the start of your problems, ladies and gentlemen, as a community. This is endemic across, I would argue, your political and religious leadership a total unwillingness to recognize the problem. Uh, only speaking about anti-Semitism, if you also say that you uh, decry Islamophobia and so on, which in, in, embeds what I think is a very uh, ill-judged uh, term. Uh, I think there are a whole set of other problems as a community, as I say, observing it from the outside and without any uh, ax to grind on this. Other problems you have, you have a problem of communal leadership. You have a, a problem of uh, embedded and often too large and, uh, frankly, obese organizations, which, um, which, apart from anything else, um, often try to stamp down and stop initiatives that do come up. And this is a big problem for your community. You know, Brendan said, you know, we need young people. Yes, but in my experience, any young person, Jewish or non-Jewish, who wants to do anything in this area is stopped by community leaders who say, we've got this in hand. It's okay. It's all being dealt with. It's not being dealt with. If it was being dealt with, we wouldn't be in this situation in the UK. Um, you know, you say, where are, the, um, where are the people and what should they do? I, a very good example of what you should do. Hold it, hold it, hold it. There's more. Um, the, 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 um, the group that just sprung up this week, Jewish Human Rights Watch, they're called, started on Monday uh, morning. Great initiative. This is the sort of thing. You won't get it from any of your communal leadership. This is a very good example of what you do. Small group of young activists. They went outside the War on Want headquarters in central London. And when those people who work for War on Want, which is a rabidly anti-Semitic, I would argue, as well as anti-Israeli organization these days, which at the moment is trying to distribute plastic guns on campuses in the UK to awaken 
rage, if it isn't already there, among young undergraduates about the crimes of the State of Israel. War on want that is using its charitable status to do that. Monday morning this week, for the first time, people turned up for work at War on Want, and there were people standing with banners saying War on Want equals War on Jews. 19th, they're calling for a boycott, of course, War on Want, BDS against Israel. Uh, the people had banners saying 1933, 2015, it always starts with a boycott, this sort of thing. First time somebody who works for War on Want doesn't just turn up in the morning thinking, oh, what a wonderful organisation I'm part of, and, and polish their halo and wonder what they can do to defame Israel today. Instead, they turned up for the first time and quite rightly were, were for the first time confronted by people who were saying, you work for a disgraceful organisation. That's the sort of thing that should have been done years ago, starting years ago in this country. But, you know, it isn't, because as a community, your bar is so incredibly low. I mean, the years I've gone to things and, and, and heard, you know, people say, I mean, really, it's as bad as, I have to say, it's, bad, it's as bad as Je suis Charlie, which I'm deeply, deeply aggravated and upset by. You know, my... It's very disturbing hearing that, that, that uh, recording from um, Copenhagen because my friends organised that meeting and were shot at in it and um, one of their colleagues was obviously killed. And um, it happens a lot these days. And for the first time, actually, Jews aren't the first targets. As my friend who was uh, at that meeting said to me yesterday, uh, you know, first they come for the cartoonists, then they come for the Jews now. That's the new, that's the new order of business. And... Uh, People weren't Charlie, ladies and gentlemen. They really weren't. They aren't. If they were, Charlie Hebdo cartoons were being published in every single newspaper and on every TV station. You know, when Nick Clegg and David Cameron and all the other political leaders say, Je suis Charlie, no, they're not. No, they're not. If Charlie Hebdo had been published in the UK, it would have been decried as a far-right-wing, racist, Islamophobic magazine that would have been shut down years and years ago. And don't think that when people say, Je suis juif, that they mean that anymore. They really don't. They really don't. It doesn't mean anything more than Je suis Charlie. It's a bit of sentimentality. But hold them to it. Hold them to it. For God's sake, you know, uh, in Doha last Friday, the sermon uh, given by the imam at the biggest mosque in Qatar. Now, just, just reflect on this, but the most biggest mosque in Qatar. I mean, you might have noticed Qatar's doing quite a lot of business in this city these days. Um, uh, what did the imam say at Friday prayers in some? He said, among other things, this. Allah, strengthen Islam and the Muslims and destroy your enemies, the enemies of the religion. Oh, Allah, destroy the Jews and whoever made the Jews. This is being, and has been in recent days, pumped round by the ministries of the Qatari government. They've been sending round the video. They're proud of it. Is anyone in this country among the community here going to say, you know, we'll raise that sort of thing? I doubt it, because people don't even raise it when it happens in this city. And it does. It really does. I would argue, just in wrapping up, if I may, this is the problem we're in. It is a, a mistake of interpretation, among many other things. People have all sorts of bigotries and biases. I don't doubt it. I don't think we're perfectible or, or, or anything like that. But the problem that we have in our time is overwhelmingly a problem of Islamic fundamentalism. And it targets not just cartoonists and Jews, but the other day, obviously, just one example, a group of Christians uh, from Egypt who were beheaded on the shores of European waters. Uh, President Obama, of course, didn't identify them as being killed because they were Christians either. He said they were Egyptians. No, they were killed because they were, they were Christians. So this is a real problem we have with, of identifying what the problem is. The problem, I would submit, then comes that people say, well, then you're going to say things about Muslim communities and, and uh, Muslim leaders that you wouldn't say about anyone else. I promise you I would say the same things about anyone else if they called for the murder of people, if they wanted to put bombs on trains or to shoot at people in their places of worship or anything else. That's the problem. There is a possibility after that that there will be secondary problems of people then, as Majid rightly says, going off with the wrong ideas, ridiculous overstatement and so on, definitely. But deal with that primary problem and those secondary problems will go away. Well, uh, plenty of food for thought from the panel um, on a wide variety of topics, but I think I'm going to dive straight in and pose the question to each of you, because this, I think, is where the, the discussion has gone, and each of you have alluded to it in some way. Okay, having identified the problem, 
or, or at least a component part of it. What do you do about it beyond identifying it? Identification is, of course, fantastic. What you've all said, yes, we need to identify it and do that. But having identified, say, there is a problem particularly of Islamist anti-Semitism uh, in France and the continent and here, what's the next step? What is the process that either government or society should do to actually tackle that? Um, Brendan, I'll throw that to you first. Uh, I think there are... I think there are two things we need to do. I think there's a short-term thing and there's a longer-term thing. The short-term thing, I think, is we have to stop acquiescing to anti-Semitism and be more confrontational when we see it. Uh, and that goes for everyone in society, people who are influential, people who work in politics, people who work in the media. We've got to be more upfront about naming it, as the other panellists have said, and, and challenging it whatever we see it. You know, the example of the... It's a small example, but I think it's very important, where last year um, lots of these kind of crazy anti-Israel campaigners went into um, Sainsbury's in Holborn, and the Sainsbury's responded by taking all the kosher food off the shelves so that they wouldn't see it and be, you know, made angry by it. That kind of acquiescence is a problem. They should have stood by the kosher products and punched anyone who tried to take them off the shelf. That's what I would do. Uh, so in the short term... Uh, in, the, in the short term, we need to stop acquiescing to anti-Semitism and challenge it. In the longer term, I think it's a bit more complicated, but I think we need to talk about what are European values, and we need to talk about enlightenment values and the values of freedom and tolerance and justice and democracy and the fact that these, these are what define our societies. Because I think a lot of radical Islam in Europe is actually ignited by the unwillingness of European societies themselves to stand up for their own traditions and their own values. And what you do, when you do that, when you, have, when you live in a society, like, for example, Obama the other day saying, um, oh, you know, stop having a go at these Islamist people because we did the same 80 years ago and we did the same in the Inquisition. You have this constant expression of self-loathing in the West, which is really bad because that, I think, really inflames Islamist sentiment. You know, why are all these young Westerners going off to join ISIS? Because they hate their own societies. Why do they hate their own societies? Yeah, it might be because they watched an ISIS video in which some finger-wagging imam told them to hate their societies. Or... It could be because they've grown up in societies that refuse to teach them the values of their societies, which in schools that don't tell them that the West and the Enlightenment are good things, in universities at which being pro-Enlightenment is basically racism. They've grown up in societies that educate them to hate their own society. So I think in the longer term, we really need to get a handle on the West's own turning of its back on the Enlightenment, which I think inflames certain groups within our societies to hate their societies. Simon's going to come and address the French context in a moment, but I'm going to throw that to Douglas as well, um, because it's a natural point. Yeah. You've been saying this for some time. Yeah, I mean, I look, there are two, there are two parts to it. I mean, there's the government bit of it, what can be done in legislation and so on. I think actually the current government's done a lot of very good things in that uh, regard. Um, there's obviously extra legislation and tweaking of legislation that can happen, but I mean, I sort of think that bit's in hand. The, bit, the, bit, the truth is, that the thing, as I sort of alluded to earlier, and it's not just a Jewish community issue here, but it's an everyone issue. The truth is, the great disappointment of the last 14 years has been that civil society has failed, that um, we can't do the things to the Islamists that we would do, as I referred to, to the neo-Nazis. You know, we're just, we're just not... It seems we're not set up for it, or people don't have the guts and the balls for it. They just... You know, they fear being called a name more than anything. And, um, you know, the thing I've always said is, we'll win when an Islamist who is not breaking the law but is saying horrible and hateful things is treated in the same way that Nick Griffin is treated. That's when we'll win. You know, because we all recognize he has a right to freedom of speech and so on and so forth, and if he's not breaking the law and it's a legal party and so on. But, you know, we don't invite him to loads of places. The Quakers don't host Nick Griffin, you know, to, to have Q&A sessions. You know, the Methodist Church doesn't celebrate the political thought of Nick Griffin. You know, the, the Anglican Church doesn't have hymn sheets that promote things that Nick Griffin thinks. Of course not. We know what to do with those types of fascists. 
But societally, we've totally failed to understand, to even recognize, and then to deal with this type of fascism. Uh, it, it's, it's a magnificently terrible failure, and we're reaping the rewards. We have to wake up to this. M Magic, by all means, answer the main thrust of the question, but I, I'm curious about one thing as well in this. Now, surely, within the Muslim community, the first victim of Islamists are normally Muslims, actually themselves, and around the world, that's certainly the case if you look at the violence in the Middle East elsewhere. What is that relationship between um, Islamism the, the, and the main body of the Muslim community, and how does that play into this, and what can, uh, aside from you know, the governmental measures which you've been working on for many years, what can happen within that community to make a change as well? Mm. I'm glad you asked me that because I actually was going to leave to the rest of the panel what wider society should do. And it's already been covered actually really, really well. Uh, and I thank both Brendan and Douglas for their points. But I did want to touch a bit upon, uh, about what I, I think my fellow Muslims should be doing more. You know, it's, 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 a, it's a great shame. Uh, the Quran lays great emphasis on self scrutinization um, and, and searching within oneself to, 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 to criticize where one has made a mistake. And I feel that. Muslim communities today um, have, are, too, are very quick to point fingers at everyone else and not really be willing to accept where their own mistakes are. So last year, to the month of the Charlie Hebdo massacres, I was on a television program and there was this young lady who was covering her face, uh, wearing the niqab, the face veil. And this young man next to her said, uh, the discussion was around offense, and this young man next to her said, you know, your face veil offends me, so you shouldn't be allowed to wear it. And I intervened, of course, and I said, look, you know, it offends me too, frankly, but just because it offends me, I, you know, I've, she's got every right to wear it. I've got every right to be offended, but what I cannot do is insist that she dresses in a way that doesn't offend me. Kind of, you know, common sense. So I defended the right of this young Muslim woman to cover her face, though I vehemently disagree with the practice. And I told her that to her face on television, live. I said, I disagree with this. I don't think it's either religiously mandated, but it's actually more, more importantly, it's degrading to women. But actually, you know, if you want to do that to yourself, fine. I, I certainly can't stop you. And I shouldn't try to. Otherwise, I'll get punched in the face. You know. um, <laughs> so what happened next? This young man uh, then undid his top a bit like this, and kind of unveiled a T-shirt. And the T-shirt he was we wearing was a, uh, a, a cartoon. And the cartoon was a, of a stick figure called J, representing Jesus, saying hi to a stick figure called Mo, representing Muhammad. And the stick figure called Mo said, how are you doing? That was the extent of the cartoon. And the young woman, who I'd just offended, turned and said to him, you can't do that because it offends me. You can't wear that T-shirt. <laughs> so obviously, I reacted exactly the way you've, you've all reacted now. And I, I intervened again. And I said, you know, being the liberal that I am, um, Small L liberal as well as big L liberal, you know, <laughs> Alan's rival. Um, I said, hold on, you know, you've got the right to wear that face veil and that offends everyone here, but fine. And he's got the right to wear, to wear that T-shirt and it offends you, fine. Everyone can wear what they want. Let's just move on. Now, what, of course, the BBC did is uh, they, 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 they cut the close-up shot of that cartoon and only showed it from a distance. Now, this was at the time, if some of you may remember, I helped Tommy Robinson leave the EDL. And it was at that time. And there was a lot of his followers who were looking to me for consistency because they were trying to work out whether they, whether they can trust this Muslimic dude. Right? <laughs> so I got a lot of hassle on Twitter. Like, you know, you were in that show. Why don't you say anything? And I thought, look, this is a moment where I can try and bring a few people together here around some common sense. So, so I tweeted the following. I tweeted the image I've just described to you, and I said... You know, I, I said, I'm sure God is greater than to take such offense at this image. Um, I, as a Muslim, am not offended at this cartoon. Uh, you know, what happened next kind of led to uh, kind of a, a downward spiral of, 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 of a, well, it's a nightmare scenario, really. Um, it, it led to multiple death threats. It led to uh, the deputy prime minister have, having to intervene on national television to say uh, he can tweet a cartoon. It led to a huge, huge problem, a petition to have me deselected from my, my parliamentary seat, which, by the way, is in Hampstead and Kilburn. Um, <laughs> and and it, why am I, where am I going with this story? Uh, Alan's question was, what should Muslims be doing? 
The reason I tweeted that cartoon is because the Islamist and jihadist narrative is that depicting the Prophet Muhammad is part of the cultural war against Islam. Now, of course, it's not, because anyone who understands anything about satire, anyone who understands anything about parody, will not listen to Ali G asking, is it because I's black, and then accuse Sasha Barakona of being racist. <laughs> and you will not watch the life of Brian and suddenly decide you're going to launch a holy crusade. Right? So it was important for a Muslim to say that so that we can disarm the Al-Qaeda narrative that these cartoons are part of a war against Islam. So what I wish happened didn't happen. What I wish happened is that more Muslims across the country said, we are also not offended by this innocuous image of our prophet saying, how are you doing to another prophet that we also believe in? If more Muslims had done that, it would have caught, well, well, Douglas and I, the last time we shared a panel, um, I think it was, I don't know where it was, and you used the phrase that you attributed to Ayan Hirsi Ali, spread the risk. It would have spread the risk to a point where it would no longer have been dangerous for people to express themselves. Now, every time we try and draw that line, the problem is it fails because people don't assume that risk. The, the risk isn't spread. We betray those voices and leave them standing alone, so literally they're shot to death. And that's what's got to stop. So part of my role is going out there and saying to other Muslims, there is nothing to fear. You say Allahu Akbar when you're killing someone. It means God is great. Surely God is greater than to take offense at such images. So what we try and do is encourage more Muslims to come forward and really have the security in their own religion not to be offended by a cartoon in the same week, in the same week when thousands of girls had been enslaved and raped in Nigeria and in Syria and in, and, and in Somalia and then 21 Coptic Christians are beheaded and the Yazidis, there's an attempted genocide against them and we choose to protest against cartoons. Well, thank you, Majid. I also think it's an appropriate time to recognise the bravery of Majid and the other panellists who've spoken out about this. It, in public. And I, you know, I say that because it should be axiomatic, it should be a normal thing to happen. But as you've heard, there have been very real death threats and very real abuse that takes place. And anyone who engages in this subject in a public domain is quickly targeted uh, by extremists and uh, attempted to be shut down. So it is worth bearing that in mind. Now, Simon, uh, you mentioned, of course, that things have got uh, are at a worse stage in France, obviously, than here. Um, in a sense, is it too late almost in France? Um, you know, the Jewish community appears to be uh, wholesale upping sticks and leaving. Um, the the French state appears completely unable to get a grip on the situation. What, in your view, what needs to happen there to, to, to salvage the situation? Can it be salvaged? Um, the situation has indeed um, gone far too, uh, far too, too long. Um, it is possible that it's too late. Um, the Jewish community, um, particularly in the, in the banlieue, in the outskirts of the big cities, um, live in a situation where tiny little things they do are actually acts of, acts of courage. Uh, when you're a religious Jew, you live in, uh, in uh, Sarcelles, outside of Paris, um, and you want to go to synagogue, or you want to put a kippah on your head, um, it's actually an act of courage, because uh, you can either get beaten up or worse. Um, most Jews have taken out their, school, uh, their, their kids from public school in these areas. There are nearly none uh, of the, uh, non, no Jewish uh, school children in public schools anymore because they face threats, insults, get beaten up. So what do Jewish parents do? They put their kids in uh, Jewish schools. Now, when you put your kids in Jewish school, you also take a risk um, because uh, look at what happened at Toulouse. And today in France, Jewish uh, schools are protected by uh, soldiers, by army personnel. Um, so um, obviously the Jewish community um, in those neighborhoods are in uh, total distress. You spoke earlier on about numbers. I want to give you one number is that uh, the Jewish community is about 600,000, 500 to 600,000 people in, um, in, in France. Um, they represent 55% of all violent racist acts. 
um, that is less, they, so meaning that less than 1% of the uh, French population have on their backs 55% of violent racist acts. So that's the situation. Um, what can be done? Um, it's not easy. Um, first of all, one of the things I would very much like to have is someone like Madrid in France. Um, the Muslim community has been extremely silent. Um, we have very, very, very little outspoken Muslim leaders. Um, we have literally no one um, on French TV. Now, unfortunately, uh, someone has taken the space by the name of Tariq Ramadan. I believe most of you do know him. Um, if that is the solution to French Islam, then we have a serious problem. Um, so what we need to see in French society is um, uh, young uh, modern Muslims who speak out, reformist Muslims who speak out, who are willing to confront um, a huge problem in their own in their own community. Uh, that's one of the things that needs to be done. Uh, it's not an easy thing. Um, we have tried to encourage, we have tried to help, uh, but it's honestly not up to the Jewish community to do that. Um, and um, and uh, but we're trying. Um, the other thing that we need to be able to see, and also um, is is civil society. Um, you mentioned this early on. We have seen very, very little from civil society. The reality is that most Jews know that it, if, if the attack last month had only been the kosher supermarket, we would definitely not have seen four million people in the streets. And it gives us a sense of solitude. It gives us a sense of uh, isolation. Um, and uh, and there is uh, there unfortunately there is not yet a wake up call. There is not yet solidarity from the rest of French society. So one of the things that the government, that Jewish community leaders need to be able to do is to encourage civil society mo movements. Try to make understand the rest of society that. Yes, maybe this is about the Jewish community, so maybe they don't care that much. Um, but it's not going to end with that. Um, and we've already seen the beginning. Uh, as you said, now um, it's freedom of speech. Um, we also have seen attacks against uh, policemen. And what's next? Um, so if, uh, if we really want to, to see things to be happen, we need to be able to see the Muslim community, and we need to see encourage uh, civil society movements. And uh, are we going to manage to do this? I, so, I honestly don't know. And, um, and I, uh, this is one of the reasons why many Jews ask themselves seriously the question today in France, whether they have a future there. And uh, it, is, uh, it is certainly not helpful for Benjamin Netanyahu to come to France and tell Jews that they should leave. But on the other hand, I can understand my French fellow Fr Jewish citizens who certainly ask themselves the question whether they should be staying. I, for myself, consider that we should be staying, that we should be uh, fighting for our rights, that uh, it's not up to the terrorists uh, and to the jihadists to decide whether we should stay or leave. But I certainly can understand the mother who uh, takes their, her her school ch child, um, her, her ch child to school, uh, that she decides not to. Well, I'm gonna, yeah, I, <laughs> yes, well, I, I'm hoping you may have. We, uh, so far, we've been very consensual on the panel. I think when Brendan threw his grenade of uh, the Netanyahu uh, statement in, it may provoke something. I don't know, Douglas, uh, you, you may not be well, answering I this. But no, well, look, I, uh, everyone, is it helpful? Has, everyone has disagreements with Netanyahu over various things. I'm just. I'm concerned, I have to say, in the, in the British narrative, I mean, I looked at the Metro newspaper, that awful junk-free paper you get on the tubes on a Monday morning, and, you know, two days after Copenhagen, what do they lead on their front page? Outrage as Netanyahu, you know, says that Jews... It's, the story is not about Benjamin Netanyahu, it really isn't. And, I mean, I, but, I, but I appreciate and, you know, and, and definitely see, obviously, sensing what Brendan and others have said. I just want to make a very quick point about the French thing, which is, I have a lot of uh, friends in, in France and a lot of Jewish friends in France, and one of the things that struck me very much in recent years is this. The, the problem that, 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 that French Jews have, to my mind, is that they are in the middle of a pincer movement, which fortunately in Britain we don't have. And what I mean is that on the one hand you have the Islamists, a very large uh, immigrant population of whom the, on whom the Islamists can draw, but the main reaction to that comes from uh, the Front National. And, and there you have this terrible problem that, that, that it is possible that historically the solution to the Islamist thing, the only one is coming from Marine Le Pen. And 
she may not be her father, but do you really want to put your future in the hands of somebody whose father is a Holocaust minimizer? No, of course not. So this is the problem. Now, in this country, I just think, you know, we're not to recognize the things that we don't have. We don't have that problem. And that is worth mentioning. You know, the farthest right, as it were, party there is UKIP really is not, an, you know, a Holocaust minimizing, Holocaust denying party. And I do think that as well as excoriating people when they get things wrong, it is very important to praise people when they get things right. But one very quick other point on that. There's a, a book that was coming out, at the, that came out at the same time as uh, the atrocities last month by uh, Walbeck, Michel Walbeck, uh, called Submission. It's a, you, some of you have read about it. There is a point in this book which I think is extremely important for what we must, after all, think of, which is how to widen this beyond the people in this room and to widen this into wider society. The most important thing in this novel is a moment where uh, the, the French professor, not to give away the whole plot, there's a French professor who everyone, uh, Muslim, uh, France is becoming a Muslim country in 2024, and this, uh, and the Jews are all leaving. And uh, this professor, who is not a, not not Jewish, he's a sort of atheist Frenchman, uh, likes his pleasures. You know, sees speaking to a, Jew, a Jewish friend who says they're off to Israel. And there's a very very important point in the novel where this man says he, he realizes he doesn't have an Israel. Now. This is a very, very important thing to tell people in general in this country. Uh, and it is far beyond Jews. I don't have an Israel. Uh, this is it. If you care about a decent, democratic, broadly pluralistic society in which you can live the life you want to live, this is the best deal and I don't have a get out option. Now, other people need to know that. I will. We're, we're going to shortly move to the audience question. If you'd like to ask a question, can I suggest you start queuing up at one? No, no, start queuing up at one of the microphones right now. Uh, in the meantime, Simon wants to just add something. Yeah, and I'm I would not, just. No, no, no. Quiet, 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 please. No, ladies and gentlemen, this has to be done. You know, in a modicum of decorum, please. Um, Simon. Yeah, I would just like to add one tiny little thing to what you just said. You're absolutely right that you don't have the same problem in, in, in the UK about the Front National. One of the, one of the most important things is that the Front National says things, and it comes back to naming things. The Front National says things that no one else is willing to do. Um, and this, one of the problems is that if the democratic, in our case, Republican voices don't say things, then the space will be taken by the populist extremist parties. Would you, Brendan, would, would you agree with that? Is, is the problem mainstream politicians now just being too afraid to say things which creates space for extremists? Yeah, completely. And particularly, actually, those who claim to be on the left. You know, I, I consider myself left-wing, which I know is a ridiculous thing to do in, in this day and age. But, you know, a left-wing tradition that was democratic and enlightened. You know, the people who sat on the left side of the French National Assembly, which is where the term left comes from, who were pro-enlightenment, pro-reason, who were... Uh, into equality and democracy and everything else. It, I think, you know, when I say Netanyahu is, is exploiting fear in Europe to make I, what I think are political gains, I think we need to recognise why he's able to do that, which is because too many people in Europe have not stood by the Jews and have not said, we are um, not going to stand for this kind of terror, we are not going to stand for this kind of illiberalism. So it's, it's a failing of European civil society and the European left which allows Netanyahu to do that in the first place. So I think there's a co combination of factors there. Okay, right. Now to the questions. What I'm going to do is take two from this side, two from that side. Um, the panellists can then decide among themselves which questions they'll address in their answers. We'll come to each of them down the way. Majid, just to warn you, I'm going to kick off with you for that. Um, but what I am going to ask is, although there is a right of free speech here, there is no right to drone on. <laughs> if you drone on, I will cut you off. I have a magical tool to do so. So um, we've just got to move on to allow everyone their right to free speech. So if we'll start on this side. If you want to just identify yourself as well, but it's your name and if you represent an organisation. Can, can everyone hear me? Yes. Um, yeah, my name's Peter Davis. Um, I have two very brief questions. No, 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 we have to have one question. Oh, well, one question I'll only. Combine, we'll combine them then. I'll combine them. Uh, firstly, um, when, when does... <laughs> <laughs> That's brought to an extra ten seconds of thinking time. Yeah. When, when does unreasonable and often inaccurate criticism is, of Israel become pure anti-Semitism? 
Um, okay, I'll leave it at that one then. Thank you. That, I'm sure there'll be a long answer for that one. Yes. Sir, why is your it, name? Edward Ben Nathan. Why is it that the um, lack of objection to anti Semitism seems to come more from the Liberal left, which I know Brendan's just referred to, but I don't understand why? <coughs> okay. Uh, when, when speakers of. Uh, could they sit down just to make space? Sir, you're next. Your name? My name is Paul Leslie. I... Speak into the, uh, into the microphone, please. Yeah. My name is Paul Leslie. I have been in regular. Th I have a, a great special interest in them. Done my own investigation, and I'm particularly addressing myself to Simon uh, uh, Rodin von uh, Kane because. Um, uh, and the question would be, and I'd like to illustrate it: uh, Is there now a case for pressure things. to be put on the French government to make sure that this disgraceful leniency shown by all too many law officers in France comes to an end? I've been in touch, regular touch, with Michel Gefankiel, Veronique Schemla. Uh, Schmulzigano, I phoned the editor of Actualité Juive okay, what is regarding the question? a follow-up. No, no, I need to... Fake no, no, you don't. What is the question? What is the question? The question is, is there a case for pressure from abroad to make sure that the judicial system punishes as they should be punished, these things? I'll illustrate it by what my, my own findings... No, 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 no. Mr. No, we, we don't have time, I'm sorry. The, the, uh, we've, the got the, we've got the question. If you want to illustrate it to Simone afterwards, I'm sure she'll be happy to listen to you on that. But she'll answer your question on whether the judicial... Si well, it's a question about the judicial system and should it actually punish people appropriately or with laws. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jonathan Paris, a political analyst. My question is about the Muslim community. Uh, Daniel Pipes wrote years ago that one of the things that will keep violence from the Muslim community in check is that the fear of Muslims that they'll be tossed out of Europe. Um, I don't see the, the, these negative incentives working. I don't see anybody talking about negative incentives. Is it even right to talk about negative incentives? In other words, when Netanyahu talks about moving to Israel, he's giving an incentive to the French to, to, get, to shape up, to keep their Jews there. What about giving the Muslim community an incentive to shape up to, to, to keep their people in line. Right, okay, so four very different questions. It's up to you how you would like to take them. Majid, I'm gonna start with you. You don't have to answer all of them, you can pick the ones you'd like to. I'd, I'd, like, to pick, I'd like to pick on uh, Peter, Peter, not pick on Peter. I'd like to pick Peter's question um, and Jonathan Paris. Uh, uh, so let's start with Peter Davis. P Peter asked about when does criticism of Israel uh, become anti-Semitism. Um, my, my friend was here until just now, and he decided to leave uh, uh, as the question started, but his name's Neil, and he and I have a common, you know, we have a joke with each other, is that he, he often comes, he's my agent as well, he comes to, when, when I speak, he comes to the event and he says, all right, I'll give you 10 minutes. You know, we could be speaking about anything. You know, the last time we had a, a conversation, it was about something completely, entirely unrelated. Um, it was actually at the Frontline Club, and the conversation that we were having was about free speech, and cartoons, and someone put their hand up. He literally, he timed it. He said, I'm gonna time it now. Someone put their hand up and said, but what about Israel? And, and, and it's a running joke between Neil and me, is that it literally, will, it, you, can, you, can, you can check your pulse according to the timing that it takes for somebody to say, what about Israel? Now, I happen to come from a, I happen to belong to a political party uh, that has a member of parliament belonging to it called David Ward. And what he did is that when people were murdered in Paris for expressing themselves, and others were murdered for being Jewish and for no other reason, he tweeted, Je suis Palestine. Now, we can reverse that, and I hope Muslims, if it were reversed, would just feel how hurtful such a sentiment at such a time can be. So, We've heard here reference made to the Chapel Hill murders. We don't yet know what the motivation was, but they were three Muslims. They were visibly Muslim. Two ladies wearing a headscarf and, and, uh, and a man. Just imagine a member of parliament, after the brutal murder of these three innocent Muslims, tweeted, just we Israel. You know, you'd be horrified. You, all of you here would be horrified because you'd think, my God, you know, that makes Israel look bad. You know, it's just appalling that somebody could tweet just we Palestine as if somehow it's an answer. Because that's the only implication one can take from it. Now, of course, it goes without saying that if Pakistan decides to send trained terrorists from Kashmir into India, I, of Pakistani descent, should not be attacked on the streets of London for it. 
It goes without saying, and unfortunately, it has to be said time and time again, because in the case of Jews, it keeps happening. And that's when you know that something that is, you know, disguised as anti-Israel criticism is in fact anti-Semitism. You know, use the disproportionate test. Use the relationship test. What on earth does it have to do with anything? And so that's the, in answer to the, to the first question. The second one, negative uh, incentives. You know, the, the one thing we do have to be careful about here is that part of what Brendan referred to in terms of, you know, reasserting enlightenment values across Europe for everyone is that everyone who's born here is a citizen, and unless, and, you know, except if they have dual nationality, dual citizenship, and they go and join a foreign army or something, but if they are British citizens, regardless of their religion or the color of their skin, you can't just deport them for misbehaving, just like you can't deport, you know, white working class lads for misbehaving. misbehaving. So we have to consider, part of the solution is, when we talk about reasserting enlightenment values and liberalism, it is reasserting it across the board. So that wouldn't be a disincentive. However, I'm sure Jonathan wasn't saying that because he was just giving an example. What I think Jonathan Paris was saying is that actually what other disincentives within the context of European society can be, can be uh, referred to here in such instances to incentivize Muslim communities to do more. Well, you know, a lot's being tried, uh, whether they are letters from Eric Pickles or, you know, all sorts of uh, outreach uh, efforts. And so I, I won't go into them too much. What I would say is there's another one point I want to touch on, and that is the partners matter incredibly. Um, you know, recently, and uh, Douglas alluded to this in his uh, remarks, you know, recently some Jewish leadership bodies have reached out to supposed leadership bodies within Muslim communities. The partnerships matter. We cannot whitewash uh, uh, what some people are saying just because they're willing to stand and pay lip service and say, yes, actually, you know what? Yeah, you shouldn't be killed because you're Jewish. Yeah, you shouldn't be. I, I, you know. Nobody deserves thank you for saying that they don't want to kill you. Right? That shouldn't even be, that is at the bare minimum. <laughs> Wait. I don't deserve a pat on the back for saying I don't want to kill you guys. So what we really look at, when we reach out for partnerships, I'm talking about the Muslim Council of Britain here, right? When you reach out for partnerships across communities, the bar shouldn't be set so low that we're happy with them just because they're saying they don't want to kill you. If at the same time in their Friday sermons they're preaching, and yes, God kill the Jews instead, or you know, anti-Semitic stuff, or anti-woman stuff, or anti-anything stuff, right? So what I'm saying is that I'm suggesting that when Jewish community leadership bodies reach out to Muslim communities, one of the things they need to start doing is actually insisting on a liberal, democratic, pluralistic, human rights-based criteria for engagement and, and calling, calling it out when it isn't that, and not just sat being satisfied with the fact that, yes, we found someone, a good Muslim who doesn't want to kill us, Brendan, over to you. Um, yeah, on the question of when criticism of Israel crosses the line into anti-Semitism, I, I just think the line has virtually been erased now. I mean, I was one of those people who always said, you know, we have to maintain a moral distinction between people who criticise Israel, which is legitimate, and people who hate the Jews, which is not legitimate. But the line is hard to find now. And I think what's happening is that all the things people used to say about the Jews are now projected onto Israel. I mean, the similarities are amazing. You know, people always go on about how Israel loves killing children. You never hear this about any other warmongering state. You don't hear this said about Britain, for example, when it launches wars, or Pakistan. It's always Israel loves killing children, which is a rehabilitation of the old prejudice about Jews sacrificing killing children. Israel controls Western politicians. It's just a, it's a, it's a bringing back to life of the old prejudice that Jews secretly control control society behind the scenes. Israel is the source of global instability. Every time there's a poll in Europe of these kind of chattering class Europeans, they always say Israel is the number one source of global war and instability. It's the old idea that the Jews are the source of instability in your society. They are the cause of your problems. So I think all those prejudices that have existed about Jews for hundreds of years are now being just projected onto Israel. And I just think it's, it's indistinguishable now between those two things. And it's, that's why anti-Israel protests are so ugly. If you ever go on them, they are just visceral and ugly. Um, in relation to why the left is the least vocal about anti-Semitism, which is odd considering that the left poses as progressive and anti-discrimination and anti-racism uh, and so on, I think the left has really lost the plot. 
uh, over the past 20, 20 years. And what's happened to the left over the past 20 years is that it's gone down the road of conspiratorial thinking. I mean, from the anti-globalization movement onwards, it's gone down the road of being anti-banker, anti-rich person, anti-Starbucks, thinking that the world is controlled by all these secret financiers who are kind of running our minds and running our lives. You can really see that in all the new left-wing movements. The WikiLeaks is 100% built on conspiracy theories. Read anything by Julian Assange. It's, Julian Assange is indistinguishable from David Icke these days. <laughs> Uh, or if you look at, if you, and of course, WikiLeaks has, within its ranks, lo and behold, anti-Semites. If you look at um, the Occupy movement, the Occupy movement is very conspiratorial, always going on about the evil bankers, their secret deals, how they're controlling the world. Lo and behold, Occupy was founded by an anti-Semitic magazine called Adbusters, which in 2004 published an article that no one ever talks about now, which listed all the people close to George W. Bush and had a black mark next to the names of the ones who were Jewish. And the headline of this article was, why won't anyone say they are Jews? This was published in Adbusters, a trendy, respectable left-wing magazine which founded the Occupy movement. So I think what we've seen with the left is they've gone down the conspiracy theory road. They've given up on trying to analyse and understand society, and instead they talk about these secret cliques, these neoliberal cabals, these gangs of bankers who run everything. And of course, the end result of every conspiracy theory in, his, in modern history is the Jews. They're behind everything, you know. Scrape away the bankers, there's always going to be a Jew there somewhere. So I think the, the, um, the left has gone down this dangerous road, which means that it now flirts, often quite openly, with anti-Semitic theories about the problems in Western society, sometimes expressed through the spectre of Israel. So that's why I think the left is incapable of challenging this prejudice, because it contributes directly to this prejudice. And it, it, it keeps this prejudice alive. And I completely agree with Douglas and others who have said that there's a, uh, there's a real problem with um, young Muslims, Islamists, and others who are adopting this prejudice. And they need to be stopped with punches or whatever. But we also need to recognize that they, it's contributed to by a left that has become intellectually lazy and also quite prejudiced and promotes a conspiratorial view of Western society and of one particular community within Western society. Salon, the question about law enforcement, is a law actually being enforced in France? Um, Yes and no. France is probably one of the most, uh, the strongest legal systems in terms of um, um, hate crimes, um, um, incitement to hatred and anti-Semitism. Um, the problem is that we are living, that, that um, we are experiencing a phenomenon where we have two different realities. Uh, when you do, when you do commit a hate crime, um, either through speech or through action, um, in real life, um, you get condemned for it. Um, um, you go to court. Um, when uh, you do the same thing on social media, um, on the internet, you don't. Um, and unfortunately, this has created a situation where um, where people can't make the difference anymore. We have we have created a sense of um, everything is allowed, and young people can't make the difference between what is what is online and what is offline. Uh, one of the things um, now President Hollande has um, has decided to do is to change the law, and because the the what everything was going on 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 the internet used to be. Um, 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 the, uh, the media law uh, was in charge of it. Uh, now the criminal code will will do that. So maybe things will start will start to change slightly. But that has been a huge problem because uh, the distinction ca sim simply can't be made. I just would like to um, say one tiny little thing um, for those of you who ask yourself the question on terms of in terms of um, the difference between um, uh, when does anti-Semitism, when un does anti-Zionism or anti-Israel um, expression become anti-Semitism? Um, I would suggest to go and look on the internet on something called the working definition of anti-Semitism. Um, it's a very useful tool. Um, it's a, it came out of a conference uh, back in 2005. I will just read to you um, some of the, of, the, of, the, of the things that are said in there, and I think they're pretty useful. Um, examples of the ways in which anti-Semitism manifests itself with regards to the state of Israel, taking into account the overall context, could include 
denying the Jewish people their right to self-determination by claiming that the existence of the State of Israel is a racist endeavor, applying double standards by requiring of it a behavior not expected of or demand of any other democratic nation, using the symbols and images associated with classic anti-Semitism, for example, claims of Jews killing Jesus or blood libel to characterize Israel or Israelis, drawing comparisons of contemporary Israeli policy to that of the Nazis, and holding Jews collectively responsible for actions of the State of Israel. I wish we would be using this, um, this definition more, um, because I think it, would, it gives us a very clear context on, on what makes the dis distinction of someone who simply criticizes uh, the policy of a government the same way it would, it it would criticize any other government, and actually anti-Semitism. Okay, um, Douglas has waved his right on this question, so we're going to go to the next round, but we'll start with Douglas there. Um, over here, yes. No, sorry. Excuse me. Uh, I'm Rosalind Pine. I just want to ask Majid a question. I don't really want to hurt your feelings, but I can think of two great Muslims who disagree with you. One is Ayan Hirsi Ali and one is Abdul Sisi. And with regard to the latter, um, he made a speech which, in which he said it's actually Islam is the problem, it needs reforming. Is this a viable option? Okay, other side. David, David Behrens. Uh, my, my question is this, that the problem, I think, goes back longer than 10, 15 years. I think it goes back 40 years ago and is a, uh, arises because of the failure of the Jewish community to realize the problem. There's been hatred being preached in the mosques 40 years ago. And my father, who was on the Manchester Representative Jewish Council, was told he couldn't say anything in the interests of good community relations. Is it really realistic that there can be reform within the Muslim community if this is a problem that goes back so long ago and people have been radicalised for so long? Back to this way. Um, Jeffrey Ben Nathan, um, Simon, we're off to Paris next week to see our French family, our French Ben Nathan family, <laughs> only to find out they've all made Aliyah to uh, Netanya a couple of weeks ago, uh, last September actually. The question to the panel, though, in very simple terms, almost yes or no, is do the panel, do the members of the panel believe that um, the um, silent majority of Muslims here in Britain and indeed in France are a silent majority disapproving of what's going on in the uh, Muslim world, or actually a silent majority actually quietly approving? Thank you. My name is Karen Lewin, and I have only a very quick comment. When anybody starts stirring up anti-Semitism in front of me, I just tell them that we're approximately 260,000 people amongst 58 million in the UK. Okay, that's, that, that's brought another question. <laughs> Hi, my name's Martin Rankoff. Um, I'd like to ask the panel um, if they believe that there is a real and current danger of respectable and established and international recognised charities being hijacked or influenced by extremist organisations for the purpose of achieving their own agenda. Based on last night's exposure documentary and also, also this week's calling out of the War on One charity, who I was fortunate to be there, whose blatant war on Jews in regards to its boycott policies is not a real threat that the extremist groups are using these charities to cross over onto the respectable side of the divide. Thank you. We'll keep on going, so I think we can get you all in this round. Go on. Hi, uh, Gabriella Stafford. I just wanted to ask really, uh, it's one question, um, but in relation to Israel and why Jews sort of take the blame for Israel um, and the left, is it not that the left have invested so much in imperialism, the idea of it, that they can't seem to extricate themselves from Israel and uh, thus they have to defend anything that happens anti-Israel. And for Majid, does he think, as a, as a parliamentary candidate, that we should be investing in the Enlightenment values that will then liberate people from having to get involved in religious discussions and what is good in one religion and what is bad in another? Okay, okay thank you. 
Jacob Kashir, Queen Mary University Atheist Secretive Humanist Society. Sorry, that's a mouthful. Um, in the wake of the Charlie Hebdo killings, uh, Douglas and Majid were really strong voices for absolute freedom of speech and not a but at the end. And I'll thank you both for that, first of all. Um, online and in the press, myself and a lot of friends found ourselves arguing with Islamist apologists. And time and time again, they would say, oh, uh, you don't have absolute freedom of speech. You have Holocaust denial laws. And they would say, like, oh, that's the exception. It doesn't exist. There is no freedom of speech. So I wondered uh, if you could comment on that. OK. Uh, Sandra Dangor, um, I've always said that things can only start progressing if the Muslim community um, starts taking responsibility from within. So when, after the uh, Charlie Abdo affair, Eric Pickles said exactly the same thing, the MCB, Muslim Council of Britain, piped up and started playing victim, and how dare he open his mouth, and how dare he criticizes the Muslim community. It is not their fault, nothing to do with them. They have nothing to do with it. So uh, would the panel agree that something has to start from within, and perhaps taking a different, uh, or, or the Muslim community having a different leadership other than the NCB that can talk more positively on their behalf? Thank you. Last two, yep. Yeah, hi, Paul, Paul Young. I, in fact, I almost didn't come tonight because I, I also listened to the recording that Majid played on uh, earlier on Sam Harris's podcast the other night, and uh, it really did chill me to the bones. I served in um, Northern Ireland back in the 80s, and uh, I don't think I've been this scared since those days, those heady days in West Belfast. But my, my point or my question to the panel is... Should we not widen this debate a little bit? Because I've been following this, this problem of Islamism as opposed to uh, Muslims. Islamism, political, the ideology, for, for some years now. And this is not just about Islam. This is about religion. And religion coming from the private sphere into the public sphere. And surely we should be talk talking about all communities and sec a secular society pushing religion back into the private sphere where it belongs. And the final question. Um, so, Simon, I'm a PhD student in sociology at London School of Economics, a hotbed of Islamist activism. And uh, my question is, have any of the panelists read, it's a somewhat controversial question, have any of the panelists read Paul Collier's book, Exodus, on immigration? And given Paul Collier's conclusions about when certain communities reach a critical mass, that they become impermeable to the, the general values of civil society, of, the, of the, the majoritarian values of that society, do they believe, and this is a controversial bit, that some restrictions on immigration and perhaps even on asylum seeking uh, should be imposed so as to give the country some breathing room and, uh, and give the country, uh, and this applies to France especially, uh, uh, some opportunity uh, to better integrate and better assimilate its, its new citizens. Thank you. Right, a ton of questions there. Um, Douglas, I promise you to start. You can start. Um, the answer to the last gentleman's question is yes. I mean, I've always taken a lot of heat for this, but my own belief is you cannot integrate people when you have immigration at this speed. The Huguenots are always cited. 50,000 Huguenots came after 1683. That was about six weeks average immigration over the last decade and a half into this country. I think it's unsustainable. I'm not afraid to say it, but it's a controversial point. A lot of other people think, you know, uh, bring a, a bunch of people from Syria to Acton and they become as London as anyone else. And, and it's just, that's not the case. These things, as Jews and others know, these take time. Um, it takes a lot of time, and I don't think it's going to work, frankly, at the speed we're going at uh, for any of our countries. I want to say very quickly, um, uh, uh, look, these are deep waters, some of these questions. Um, so let me plunge straight in. <laughs> um, look, I, I differ from others on this panel, and I'm sure in this room, in that, um, yeah, I think, I think there is a fundamental problem that Islam is unwilling to phase up to, and that... It's come, it comes from the origins, it's there in the origins, it's not insuperable, it's not unsolvable, it's not impossible to be overcome, but it is there. And um, General Sisi, I mean, 
you know, I wish it hadn't been him who'd said it. But General Sisi was right, uh, and he was right to lecture the scholars of Al-Azhar about this. If you doubt this, consider just two of my favorite important Al-Azhar comments recently. One is that, uh, um, uh, one was a statement in December from Al-Azhar saying that ISIS, uh, yes, they are terrorists, but they are not to be deemed heretics. This is a very, very important point. This is not an ignorant point. Uh, and the second was the reaction to the burning of that brave young Jordanian pilot. Uh, senior scholar of the Al-Azhar says, um, the Imam, uh, says uh, they had violated the laws, the Islamic prohibition on def defiling a body. And what must be the punishment for the people who did that? Crucifixion. <laughs> You've got to take your last where you can these days, ladies and gentlemen. I'm chopping off one hand. Um, yes. Now uh, uh, look. Um, let, let, let's move on quickly to a couple of other quite deep waters, but let me do it briefly. The silent majority, no, no. We know that it's not, a, it's, 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 it's not a minority problem within Muslim communities in Britain we're talking about. Why do we know this? Because a dear friend of mine called Mehdi Hassan very kindly provided me and you with an article uh, 18 months ago saying, anti-Semitism among Muslim communities in the UK is endemic and rife and commonplace. He said it is, and all Muslim readers will know what I'm talking about, our dirty little secret. This cannot be reiterated often enough. That's Mehdi Hassan, who I don't think anyone would describe as, as a progressive. Um, but let me very quickly, on the, uh, finally, on this business about the free speech and Holocaust denial laws, I'm, there are reasons why France and Germany and countries on the continent have Holocaust denial laws, and it's important to know why. I'm against them because I believe in the tradition of Milton and Mill that bad ideas will be chased out in a free expression and free speech. Bad ideas will be chased out by good ideas. And that in a free and open discussion, there's no way that the Holocaust deniers will win. There's no way. The only chance we have to win is if we shut down the discussion and people get lazy and flabby and forget their facts and then the people who know most about it end up being the deniers. That long term is the problem and that's why I'm against them in the long term. But, <laughs> but, let me, but let me reiterate, there are reasons on the continent why they have them. But just very quickly, if I may, on this free speech issue, which it comes back to, I started on it and I want to finish on this for me. The free speech issue matters so much, and why, they, why people are literally gunning for it so much is the following reason. It is an accident of Scandinavian history that a cartoon and cartoons ended up being the front line on this. Pure accident. I care about this not because I'm a cartoonist, but because it could have been anything else. It could have been a piece, it could have been a book, a novel, a song, it could have been an idea. What they are trying to stop is the idea. This is a very well chosen target. They have chosen their targets well, and they've chosen them carefully, because people now do not want to talk about the idea. And some of the things I say, I know that they make people uncomfortable, but increasingly it's more than discomfort that people say. That is why the terrorists are doing so well. They can only win if they stop us being able to speak and express ourselves. And that is why the cartoon matters so much. As my friend who organized that meeting in Copenhagen said to me the other day, you know, it is about the cartoonists first and then the Jews. And people say, well, why, why don't you stop publishing cartoons if they offend people? Why don't you impose effectively a de facto Islamic blasphemy law? She said, it's because what are we meant to do about the Jews? Do the Jews have to stop being Jews? What's the next target after that? What's the thing that has to stop because it offends people? after that. That's why the line has to be drawn so clearly on this. Unadulterated freedom of speech, including saying that people, things that people find offensive, because it's the only way that the correct and good ideas have any chance of winning, and they have to win. Come on, over to you. Yeah, I would like, um, you said much of what I, I had, uh, I, much better, but uh, what, I, what I wanted to say. Um, I would just like to say something about the silent majority. Um, in France, um, on, in November 2014, a couple of months ago, a poll was done uh, for the first time about anti-Semitism and public opinion. And a second poll was done on anti-Semitism in the Muslim community. Um, it was a very scary poll. 
um, because um, it shows that a vast majority of Muslims um, hold anti-Semitic views. Um, going from Jews have too much power in finance, Jews have too much power in uh, media, there is a, a Zionist conspiracy that is controlling uh, French and world society, etc., etc., etc. The scarier thing about it was that there was no distinction in terms of age, no distinction in terms of socioeconomic status, no distinction in terms of education, no distinction whether they were in, Le B in the banlieue or whether they were in, in, in nice sub suburban areas. Um, the only distinction was the level of religiosity, meaning that those who consider themselves less religious are far less anti-Semitic than those who are more religious. Now, more studies need to be done, um, but it obviously doesn't, uh, doesn't give us a lot of hope in terms of the silent uh, majority, at least not in France. Brandon. Yeah, on, on that issue of the silent majority, I th I'm always struck actually by the similarity in thinking between mainstream Muslim groups and radical Islamist groups. Uh, you know, they, they, might use, they might be more PC, these mainstream community groups, but they have a similar thinking, which I think is the cult of victimhood. You know, their capacity for self-pity is boundless among some of these people. Um, you know, they're convinced that society's out to get them. You know, they're constantly demanding that, you know, all the wars that they've recently gone through should be part of, um, you know, Holocaust Day and all that kind of thing. It's this, it's this demand that you recognise their pain. That's what they all say. And in fact, bin Laden said the exact same thing. If you, if you, try, if you trawl through his statements, which was published by, by Verso, because of course left-wingers love to publish uh, Islamist terrorist statements, uh, he talks a lot about you know, the failure of the West to recognize the suffering of Muslims. So I'm always struck by the similarities between those two outlooks. Um, and that comes on to a point I wanted to make about immigration, because I, I think... I'm really pro freedom of movement. I think freedom of movement is a really good thing. Uh, and I think the problem with saying that immigration is the problem is that it kind of lets society itself off the hook. Because when I go to universities and do talks about Islam and free speech and whatever, the craziest people in the audience are, have got English accents. They were all born here. They're the, the children, or actually the grandchildren, of immigrants. They grew up in this society. They're integrated. They wear trainers underneath their smocks. They, uh, the girls have lipstick. They, they are Western. Um, and, you know, in fact, if you, a, a lot of the time their parents and their grandparents are actually quite moderate and a lot of them wear Western dress. It tends to be the younger generations who wear foreign dress and who adopt these kind of very foreign and often quite backward ideas. So I think the problem is, is, is here at home, actually, and the failure of Britain, in this case, to integrate immigrants in a convincing way. And I think we should put more effort... And that's because I think Britain no longer knows what it stands for. And so you can't welcome immigrants if you don't know what you stand for, because when they come... Like, where I come from, this small place in North London called Burnt Oak, uh, it's surrounded by Jewish areas. It's a small little Irish working-class suburb, which has more recently been... Um, taken over, I was going to say, but that's racist. More recently, <laughs> there have been a lot, of Im a lot of immigration there from Africa and other parts of the world. And they've transformed the whole community. It now looks and sounds foreign. And I don't think it's their fault. I think it's because they've come to a society which no longer elevates its own values over other people's. And that relativism acts as a green light to communities to do their own thing. So that's the problem we've got to tackle. Just quickly on freedom of speech, I think... Um, I, I completely agree with Douglas. I think freedom of speech is the issue. And I think I'm completely opposed to Holocaust denial laws for the reason Douglas outlined. I think they make the problem worse because they feed into a view amongst these already quite potty people that we've got something to hide. We're defensive. We can't prove that the Holocaust happened, so we have to f surround it with this force field protecting it from public debate. It feeds into their whole kind of conspiracy theory, so we should just allow them to say whatever they want, publish whatever they want, and we should confront it and argue against it with facts. But one quick thing. In, in Denmark, where the killing happened, and th that guy, we presume, was offended and therefore thought he had the right to kill those who offended him, we have to remember that the actual penal code in Copenhagen 
forbids people from degrading or insulting groups of people on the basis of their faith. So he didn't have to trawl the internet and look for Islamist videos telling him that it's really bad for people to offend your faith. He didn't have to read the Quran to get that idea. It's written into the law of his own country. And that's one of the problems we face today. We live in, in Europe, there are too many hate speech laws. There are too many pieces of legislation forbidding the insulting of Islam or the ridicule of certain groups of people. We need to dismantle piece by piece every piece of censorious legislation in Europe and send the message you do not have the right not to be offended. That's not a right you enjoy in Europe. If you live in this continent, you will be offended, and you have to get used to it. Majid. OK, so uh, on, on, I think people have addressed immigration, people have addressed free speech. Uh, so. I think it falls upon me to discuss the reform in Islam question, doesn't it? Because, uh, so your hour uh, lecture starts now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so Roslyn, Jeffrey, Gabrielle, Sandra, and Paul all asked things that related to this big, big uh, issue of reform within Islam. And uh, let me start by this. Sam Harris was mentioned. Um, <clears throat> Sam Harris, for those of you who don't know, um, is uh, a bit like the Richard Dawkins of the United States. Uh, he's one of the neo-atheist thinkers, uh, a critic of religion per se, not just Islam, a critic of all religion. And he was mentioned because somebody mentioned that he had that recording in his, in his podcast, which he did. Uh, touching on reform within the faith. I'm, uh, Ayan Hirsi Ali was also mentioned. I have been in long discussions with Sam Harris, with Ayan, with... Douglas, uh, all of whom have similar views about my religion. And the culmination of my long conversation with Sam Harris is that we have uh, transcribed the dialogue and we're soon to publish it, hopefully this summer. Um, and it's about the question of reform. And we tackle the issues head on. Uh, Douglas knows because he's read the thing. And it's very good and <laughs> it's available in Kindle when it comes out as well. <laughs> anyway, I, I'll do the plug yeah. because he's not going to. So, as well as print, yeah, both. Print. Oh, yeah. Um, now, it's an attempt to really have this conversation because, Roslyn, you know, it didn't offend me that you asked this question. In fact, Ayan was at my wedding. I'm not offended whatsoever my wife is there. I met Ayan at the, tw as, as actually did Douglas and Ayan, they were both opposed to me in the panel. Yes, no, no, not at all. And, and actually, Ayan and Douglas and everyone, you know, we have to start having these conversations, not just about Islamist extremism. And I'll, I'll tell you why. Because of what Douglas mentioned, that the Azhar University response was more than what Douglas said. When they said this, that, that the correct Islamic verdict against ISIL burning the Jordanian pilot, Mu'az al Qasasba to death, was crucifixion, they went further and they also said, which I was trying to prod him to, to mention as well, they said that one hand and one foot on alternative limbs should be cut off. Now, where they get this from is actually the Quran. There's a passage in Arabic from the Quran that addresses what's called in Arabic hiraba, which means highway robbery. And the punishment for hiraba, or, and the passage continues to say, those who sow mischief in the land, is this form of amputation of one hand and one foot from alternate limbs. So you've got a serious problem here that it's actually in what many Muslims hold to believe is the immutable word of God. Now, Azhar University are not Islamist. They are what I call traditionalist. And in this book with Sam, what, what I've tried to do in response to Sam's questions is go through all the different categories. Islamists, i.e. those who want to impose a politicized version of religion over society. Traditionalists, medievalists, in other words, fundamentalists. You know, those who will be extremely regressive in their views, but within the existing framework. Like, you know, for example, in Egypt, yeah? The existing, existing structure, and they will want that law to remain you know, misogynist, or remain homophobic, or remain entrenched in medieval values. So even once we deal with the, the challenge, the intellectual challenge of Islamism, even once that's defeated, we've got a serious, serious problem with medievalists um, <clears throat> that also needs to be addressed head on. And so the answer to your question is yes. Not only do I take issue with Islamist extremism, <clears throat> I take issue with what I call the regressive medievalist interpretation of Islam by 
Muslims who aren't Islamists, such as what we've just heard that came out from Azhar. That needs to be addressed head on. There does need to be a reform of the way Muslims look at their scripture. There does need to be a reform even among non-Islamist Muslims. There needs to be a very frank and open conversation. Part of the problem is that that conversation, as Brendan was referring to earlier, isn't being had because what instinctively happens is the, uh, is the, is the, the offense defense is erected. You can't say that because I'm offended. And the minute we start talking in that way, you know, you're a bigot because you just said Islam is problematic. And I say, well, you're a bigot too. And then, you know, the conversation breaks down. And when, when that conversation breaks down in that way, it happened in the United Kingdom through the 90s. People felt they were unable to have these conversations. The people that feel, as we've heard already tonight, the people that fill that void in the middle when you feel uncomfortable in having these conversations, I mean, it's odd. You feel uncomfortable in actually saying it's wrong to say that the solution to jihadism is to amputate, am, amputate people's hands and limbs. You know, if you feel uncomfortable saying that, then the EDL are very happy to fill that void. And they're very comfortable it's, uh, to say that. And that's what happens when we feel like we can't have those conversations. So yes, the answer to uh, Roslyn's question, to, 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 to Jeffrey's question, to Gabrielle's point, to Paul asking about religion, to Sandra, the leadership have failed us. And yes, the answer is that we need, uh, 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 as well as challenging Islamism within Muslim communities, we need a reform discourse. And what's the answer? What's the alternative? Well, I would argue, let's not get stuck in the kind of what's a good Muslim, what's a bad Islam, what's good Islam debate. I don't care what somebody, how many times somebody prays at home and, and what they cover with their head with and how long their beard grows and how high their ankle trousers are up to their shins or whatever. I don't care about any of that, as long as they don't try and impose that on anyone else. So that's why I'm an honorary associate of the National Secular Society. The solution to all of this is to reassert small L liberal, human rights, pluralistic, democratic values and grow a spine. One, one quick final point from Douglas Can to I just, I just wanted to detain you for 30 seconds longer, if I may, just mention that, that uh, you know, famously Anna Akhmatova was visited in, in Moscow in the worst days by Isaiah Berlin, and she had a conversation that was free about ideas, and she said to a friend afterwards, it was like meeting a visitor from the future. What you've just heard is the future. That is the answer. And there are very few people who are willing to say it, and I think that deserves an enormous amount of tribute. Well, I'm afraid we've run out of time for tonight. Um, it just leads me to thank the panel. But before I do, I think two things have come out of tonight that I think need to be said. The first is obviously that this is a problem, the ownership of which belongs to everyone in this room. Everyone in this room has a part to play in solving the problem and doing something about it. You've done something tonight by coming, it's true, but there's more that can be done and needs to be done by all of you to join uh, with non-Jews, others, you know, to, to participate in this and to fight this cause. It's not a Jewish issue, it's an issue for society. That I think we've heard quite openly tonight on the panel. And the second thing is, and I don't want anyone to be left in any illusion about this, the issue about reform that we've heard here, um, say within the Muslim community, is very important for us to understand this is not a question of Muslims v everyone else in this question. I, you know, this is about everyone else and Muslims against extremists. Yes, there may have to be a conversation within that community about this, but this cannot be seen by Jews or others as a vilification of one particular community here. It's very important we say that and say that because the solution can only be a long-term solution if we have support within that community for these goals as well. So that's all from us now. I want to thank uh, Central Synagogue for their part, and I think Rabbi Marcus is going to uh, give the formal end note now. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, I want to, on your behalf, thank the panel for enlightening us I want to thank Stephen for his efforts, and maybe this will be the opening of a wider dialogue, as you just alluded to, Alan. I don't want anyone to walk out of here feeling depressed and uncomfortable, um, despite what we heard um, from Simon in terms of France. So I think one of the uh, things I'd like to suggest, firstly, is to thank the courage of our panelists here. Uh, 
and may what be a good idea, I think, is if we could clone Douglas, Majid, and Brendan. Being the three non-Jews on our panel, we need more like you, and we need to hear those voices. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.